Now we've uh, of course been in this study for some time and I just want to remind you of our theme verse which is 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. The Bible says be diligent to present yourself that is you make the effort to present yourself approved to God. That means that something that God will uh, favorably pass judgment on. And then he gives the expression here, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. My dad was a carpenter, and he could walk into a building, and he could look at it, and he'd say, this is a quarter inch out of square. He just knew that kind of thing. Um, and he was a, a craftsman, and I remember I took him up to the hay house in, in Macon, which is one of the beautiful old antebellum homes that are there. And he walked into this ballroom that's there. It has a, a beautiful uh, sliding uh, folding track um, where they could close off part of the area for an orchestra. My dad looked at this, and the guy who built this, he said, was a craftsman. Now that tells you um, how a worker wants to be perceived. And... Uh, this is what he's talking about here. Rightly dividing or correctly interpreting the word of truth. Now, one of the ways that we need to do that is to understand that there are, are not one judgment. There are many people say there's going to be this big judgment at the end of time and that God is going to get all people from all ages and everything like that. He's going to bring them there and he's going to judge all of humanity. It's called a general judgment. But that is something that is clearly not taught in the word of God. In fact, the Bible teaches that there are seven major judgments in the plan of God. And so we want to look at those seven today and see if we can bring um, this into sharp focus. So you turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter number two. I'm going to come there in a few minutes, but um, we're going to talk a little bit about judgment first and what judging means. Um, I've heard people say, Judge not lest you be judged. And they're quoting from the Sermon on the Mount. And in the same, um, very same passage, Jesus says, but when you judge, judge righteous judgment. So, you know, you, you, taking it out of context to say, judge not lest you be judged. Um, Jesus said that we have to make right judgments. And so let's define our terms when we come to the subject of judgment. So what is judgment? What do we mean when we use the word judge? What about when we mention the word judgment? Well, to judge, and this is the first of your blanks on your handout, is to decide a controversy by pronouncing an opinion concerning right or wrong. Now, if that judgment is based upon something that you cannot control, that you cannot help, that you a decision you didn't make, for example, the color of somebody's skin. We never judge on the basis of the external. You can't control how you were born, where you were born, when you were born, who your family was, and things like that. And to judge somebody on the basis of something like that is called prejudging or prejudice. That's not what he's talking about here. This is an opinion concerning right and wrong, and it has a basis, and that basis is the Word of God, the character of God, the nature of God. A decision is made, there's some discernment. Now, you might say, well, you know, I, I don't like this whole idea of judging. Do you realize everything you do in life is pretty much a judgment? I used to work in insurance. I was an executive for GEICO, the automobile insurance company. And part of my job as an underwriter for the company was I had to make judgments all the time. Do we, uh, do we give this person the best rates or do we raise the rates on this other person? And, oh, we got in trouble all the time. People didn't like the fact, but we judged on the basis of, a, uh, of evidence. So if somebody keeps crashing their car into something, you better understand your rates are going to go up. 
You say, well, what about when I get older and my rates are going up and everything like that? Well, that too. We look at tables that say that people are a certain age, they're going to have more accidents and such like that. And so we're making a judgment based on facts and evidence. Now, let's talk about um, this, this judgment and this conclusion. Um, when we talk about judgment, a judgment is what is done when, you, when a judge judges something. He makes a decree or a decision which one passes on the wrongs of others. In other words, a judge is basically um, someone who looks and compares it to the standard of the word of God and says, this, this is wrong, it shouldn't be done. Now, these words, judge and judgment, um, in, the, in the Greek, krino, um, and Christus, basically these words are in one form or another in our Bible some 758 uh, times. So I'd say judgment is a pretty good subject. And when we think of the Old Testament, we think of judgment in the form of a person, that is King Solomon. And, and Solomon um, in First Kings chapter 3 uh, he's about to begin his reign. He lays down at night. He's having a dream. And God appears to him and says, ask for anything you want. And uh, he says, well, I, what I need is the judgment to be able to judge this people. And God said, because you didn't ask for riches, because you didn't ask for um, wealth, I'm going to give you wealth, I'm going to give you riches, I'm going to give you a long life, but I will make you capable of making good judgments. Well, how does that play out? Well, very early in his, um, in his uh, reign, he faced a situation. There were two women. They were both called harlots in the Bible. They were prostitutes, and they had children of their own. One woman had her baby and she laid it in the bed with her and as she was laying in the bed with her she rolled over on it and it died and so she woke up in the middle of the night realized that she had killed her own baby and took the other woman's baby and substituted it and put the dead baby underneath the other woman well you know what happened. The two women woke up. Accusations began to uh, fly one way or the other. And they were brought before the king. And the king had to make a decision. He needed to make a judgment. And you know what? He exercised tremendous uh, wisdom. He said, uh, bring me a sword. Bring me the baby. And so um, he brought the sword, brought the baby. And uh, he stood up and he said, um, there's no way to tell one way or the other. They didn't have DNA back in those days. We don't have any way of saying it. I'm just going to take this sword and we'll cut the baby in half. Well, the woman who is really the mother of the child screamed out, no, no, don't kill my baby. Here, let her have it. I'd rather it live than to have you cut it in half. And Solomon said, well, um, I know who the mother really is and was able to give the baby back to its proper birth parent. And so the Bible says, all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered and they feared the king for they saw the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. And it was the place of the king as the sovereign ruler of the nation of Israel to render judgment by deciding these controversies and passing decisions on which was right and wrong. He arrived at the right conclusion, which is called justice. So we've discovered what judging means. Let's talk about God as judge. We all should recognize, whether you recognize it or not, is not the point. You may say, I don't believe in God, I don't think there is a God or whatever like that. You still are going to face that God sometime in judgment. And so we're going to have to find out that God is the ultimate judge and this reveals the fact that God is a righteous judge. I want to read to you from um, Psalm 96. Psalm 96. And I'd like you to follow along with me. 
Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his holy name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, among the heathen. His wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. And he's to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But it was the Lord that made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O families of people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come to his courts. Now why? Well, notice the next phrases. O worship the Lord in the beauty of the holiness. Tremble before him all earth. Why? Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It shall not be moved. Notice, he shall judge peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all of its fullness. Let the field be joyful in all that is in it. And all the trees of the wood shall rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the earth in righteousness and the people in his truth. Ultimately, God is going to judge the world. And when Jesus Christ comes to set up his kingdom here upon the earth, he will not judge according to eyes or ears, but he will judge according to truth. He will judge according to facts. He will judge righteously. You're going to get the right judgment here upon the earth? Uh, you may or may not. Depends on who's in power at the time. But I will tell you this. When Jesus Christ rules and reigns, there will be righteous judgment. Which then brings us to the fact that the judgment of God is not only righteous, but it's certain. Notice what it says in Romans chapter 2, where I had you turn. Romans chapter 2. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those that practice such things. Now, the, the idea here is that God is judging, and we know that he's going to judge, and it is true that he will judge. We know these things are going to come to pass. This is certain. This judgment is certain. You can do whatever you want to avoid the judgment of God, but that judgment is coming. It is certain, and you cannot avoid it. Um, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 2, uh, verse um, 2, and uh, the first part, we know the judgment of God. God's judgment is certain. That brings us to the second thing, and that the judgment of God is according to truth. Let's read the rest of that verse. The judgment of God is according to truth. Now, what is the standard of truth? The standard of truth is the word of God. And uh, the word of God speaks against the things that evil people do. God is all-knowing. He knows all the facts. God will be fair because the judgment is according to truth. Nobody's going to say, well, it was because I'm a Democrat or because I was a Republican or because this happened or because that happened. God will always judge right. Then the Bible tells us not only that, but there is no escape from the judgment of God. Um, look at verse 3 here of chapter 2. And look at the last part of that verse. It says that you will escape the judgment of God. Um, do you think you're going to escape the judgment of God? There is no escape from the judgment of God. When the moral man looks down his long nose at the immoral man and points his finger and says, You're guilty! Notice how many fingers are pointing back. You see, um, the fact is that uh, you cannot escape the judgment of God. The fact that you judge other people indicates that you understand that you are culpable for judgment. Just because your motive was impure, just because um, what you did was um, internal and not external, do you think that God did not see that? 
God knows your motives. He knows what's happening. And it is inescapable that you will face the judgment of God. And then um, the Bible tells us that the judgment of God is coming in spite of God's present patience. Again, notice what the scripture says here. Or despise the riches of his goodness, the forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. But according to the hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Do you realize how gracious God really is? It's not that he is willing that people perish. He gives people plenty of opportunity. But oftentimes, he also gives them plenty of rope with which to hang themselves. Don't think that the patience of God and his graciousness means that he's not going to judge. He will judge. And he warns those who reject the Lord or fail to change their mind about Jesus Christ that they are simply storing up for themselves a wrath against the day of judgment which will surely come. And then the Bible tells us it, it, the judgment of God will be according to one's works. You're not going to be judged because of somebody, something somebody else did, but what you did. The Bible says who will render uh, to each one according to to his deeds, eternal life to those by patient continuance of doing good, seek for glory and honor and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, that is, don't believe the gospel. Um, the Bible says, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish upon every soul who does evil. Of the Jew first, also to the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works that which is good to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. Now, you'll notice that the judgment is according to works. The problem is that God's standard is perfection. So your works compared to God's perfection, you're going to come short. Can anybody measure up to the wor perfect rule? A preacher one time got up and said, um, I don't believe there's a perfect man on this earth since Jesus Christ. And he said, uh, if, if you're a perfect man, will you stand up? Or if you know a perfect man, will you stand up? And one little guy in the very back of the church stood up. And he said, sir, are you really telling me that you are perfect? And he said, no, sir, absolutely not. He said, but I'm standing up because my wife uh, was a widow when I married her. And he said, I found out that her first husband was absolutely perfect. And everything he did was perfectly right. So I know of a perfect man. Well, the standard is God. And we need the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ put to our account through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only God can justify us. And that's what Romans chapter 3 and verse 21, chapter 4, and the first, cha cha uh, first uh, part of chapter number 5 is all about as we're studying in our um, study in the second hour. So the judgment of God then is um, according to our works, but it's also impartial. For there is no partiality with God. If you're going to be tried and to be justified by the law, then you have to faithfully keep the law every single point all of your life and never one time violate the law. Now, can I ask you this question? Has anybody ever done that? Only one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, nobody can measure up to that standard but when God judges, he's not going to judge on the basis of, I like this one or I don't like that. That's one of the reasons why I don't believe in this Calvinist doctrine of election. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All of us were rotten. All of us were wicked. All of us needed a savior. And so a lot of people ask me, how are you doing? And I basically say, I'm doing better than I deserve. 
Why? Because I deserve to be in hell. But because of the marvelous, matchless grace of God and the fact that God is impartial and opens salvation to every man, Jew, Gentile, Greek, um, wise, unwise, all men, all men are under the grace of God because God is impartial. And so that leads us then to this statement. There is no partiality with God. And then the Bible says that God is going to judge us according to light. And I'm not going to read this because there's plenty of things here. But he says basically, if the Gentiles do that which is right, God is going to bless them. If the Jews do that which is wrong, God is going to judge them. Why? Because they're doing right or they're doing wrong. Unfortunately, the Gentiles can never do what was necessary to bring about salvation, and neither could the Jews. That's why they need the Lord Jesus Christ. But God is going to judge each person according to the light that they had so that somebody living in middle Georgia who is in the belt buckle of the Bible belt, they don't have to worry about um, when they stand before God, God is going to judge them very strictly. Why? Because they were in a place where they could know. Some uh, person who had a very limited knowledge and all of that, God is not going to judge them nearly as, as strictly because they didn't know as much. And that's what's involved here in impartiality and according to light. And then God is going to judge according to Jesus Christ. He is going to execute all this judgment through Jesus Christ. The Bible says this, in the day when God will judge, that's in the future tense, the secrets of men uh, by Jesus Christ, future tense, according to my gospel. Jesus Christ is going to be the judge. You know, the first time he came, he came to be our savior. The second time, he came to be our judge. And so let me say this to you today. You need to fall on him now so that someday he will not fall on you in judgment. And then the Bible tells us that the judgment will be according to the gospel. Notice here, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. That is the standard that God is going to use. The gospel is about Jesus Christ, God's son. And by the way, when Paul was using the words my gospel, he's not saying that the gospel is according to him or exclusive to him. He's saying simply, I embrace the same gospel I'm presenting to you because Jesus took my place on the cross of Calvary, died my death, had the payment applied, and rose the, the third day so that God could say, I am in total agreement with what Jesus did. Paul said, that's what saved me, and that's what Paul is offering to you. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you either believe the gospel or you will be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so no wonder Paul could say in the, um, in the book of Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also for the Greek. And then he tells young Timothy in uh, chapter 2 and verse 4 of uh, the, the uh, epistle to Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and in his kingdom. And so the scripture says whether you're saved or unsaved, whether you're Jew or Gentile, we're all going to be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. So that then brings us to the seven judgments of God. And I want to begin with the judgment of sin. The judgment of sin. This is our major problem. You know, years ago in the United States, um, the engineers of NASA had one major problem. That was to launch a man into space to help him circle the earth and then to bring him safely down. 
That was a major problem. It required a great deal of engineering in order to do that. I've run into people who've told me they don't believe that men did that. I do believe that God allowed men to do that kind of thing. But I want to say to you today, a much harder problem was how to deal with sin. How can God take fallen man, bring him to the place of fellowship with God, and then give him an eternal home? Well, here we go. Um, the judgment of sin. This is something that was done for you. And it begins this way. It happened at 30 or 33 A.D. Yeah, either one is acceptable. You can, uh, um, there's, there's some argument about when Jesus was actually born. But you're right to say either 30 or 30 D, 8, 33 A.D. in a place called Calvary. What happened there? Well, that's a beautiful story. The judgment of sin took place on Calvary's cross. There was the God-man, the person who had knew no sin, and Jesus became sin for us. And God dealt with sin right there on the cross, fully and finally in the death of Christ. See, this is the difference between us and Roman Catholicism. This is the difference between us and many of the world religion. We believe that God took care of our sins on the cross of Calvary. It's paid completely in full, as you remember pastor's message the other day, to tell us die. It means paid in full. And so let's look at where we're on the timeline here. And uh, this happens, this is the first judgment of God right here. It is what God did for us on the cross of Calvary God laid all of our sins upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He paid for every single sin that we ever committed. Now you ask yourself, how could he do that? Well, let me say this to you. He was God. And because he is God, he can do things infinitely. You say, but yes, none of my sins have been committed. That's exactly right. In fact, that means that Christ can die for your sins, past, present, and future. Why? Because at the time Jesus died in 33 AD, Jesus Christ was dying for all of your future sins. He had not yet committed a single one of them, but Christ died for every single one. You say, well, you mean I can do whatever I want to and get away with sin? No, God put your sin, the punishment of your sin, on the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. All right, so let's look at that. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he made, that's God, he, God, made him Christ, who knew no sin by miracle of the virgin birth, to be sin for us. God made him the sin offering for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. And then the Bible says this, for Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust. So it's a vicarious thing. He died in the place of other people. It was not my, it was not his death he died. It was my death he died. Christ suffered once for sin. By the way, do you realize this? Christ is the only person in the world who um, died spiritually before he died physically. Now, that happened with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Um, he was the first Adam. And this last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, did exactly what he... He died on the cross physically um, of several hours after he died on the cross uh, spiritually. What is death? It is separation. He said, um, while he's hanging there on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit turned their back on the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time in all of time and eternity. The Trinity became separated from each other in that Jesus Christ took our place on the cross of Calvary. God laid our sins on him and treated him as if he were our sin. And so the Bible says Christ having suffered once for sins. By the way, this is this puts a death knell to Roman Catholicism. 
Why? Because they're reenacting the death of Christ every time they have the Mass. The Bible says Christ died, suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And so Jesus Christ took our place. And no wonder then the Bible says, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angel, became, becoming a man, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, seated at the right hand of the Father, that he, by the grace of God, might taste of death for every man. No wonder Paul could say, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Jesus took the sting out of death. Jesus gave the victory over the grave. And so once again, we see the wages of sin is death. There's going to be a judgment on sin, but God already took care of that. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus came to taste death for every man, which is the penalty of sin. And when Jesus died, the judgment of sin took place. And so he tasted death for everyone, which tells us then that he treated sin completely not just for the elect not just for the saved but for everyone and everyone has provision made for their sin so you know when we witness to people the issue is not their sin the issue is do you believe on the son that is the single issue in salvation your sins have been paid for do you believe on the son this man, when he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. I, I teach a Bible class on Tuesday, and I made mention of this verse on uh, my Tuesday class, and I said, you know, in the tabernacle, you will find a good number of things, a place to wash your hands, a place to offer sacrifice, a place to eat bread, a uh, place to uh, say prayers, a place to tend lights, um, all of those things are there, but there's not a single chair in the tabernacle. Why? Because in the tabernacle, the work of the priests was never done. And then my student, Matthew Brown, said, but I want to show you something. And he showed me a, a brief video he had taken. He had gone to one of these tours that has a mock-up of the tabernacle. And when you stepped inside the curtain, there were a bunch of folding chairs there. And he said, but this tabernacle has chairs. I said, yes, but the real one did not have a single chair. But when Jesus finished the work of redemption, the Bible says he sat down forever on the right hand of God. He provided salvation. Look, there is nothing you have to do. Jesus didn't pay 10% and you have to pay the rest. He didn't pay 90% you have to pay the rest. He didn't take 99% and you have to pay the rest. Jesus paid it all. And when he sat down, it was fully paid for. So that brings us to the second judgment, the judgment of self. And when does that take place? Well, the Bible tells us about that. It happens right now in our life as Christians. And it happens right here upon the earth. Um, and let's just get a brief description of it. The judgment of self goes through, throughout the believer's life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, Paul says that if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Um, if we're carefully evaluating our own spiritual lives, according to 1 John 1, 9, we can avoid the chastening of the Lord. I have heard so many people tell their children, you do that again, Johnny, and you are really going to get it. You do that again, Johnny, and you're really going to... God is not a permissive parent. God is a great disciplinarian. He knows how to mold his sons and daughters into what they ought to be. But he gave us a way to avoid this, this um, discipline that takes place. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged by God. So you say, when does this judgment take place? Well, 
It takes place during the church age, all during this time. As we're walking down here and we're, um, we're living and, and all of that, we will make decisions that are wrong and do things that are stupid. And so God says, I'll give you a chance to avoid having my disciplined hand. Now you say, well, can you show this anywhere in the Word of God? I sure can. Uh, look at the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There are all kinds of problems in the Corinthian church. The, these people, by the way, God calls them saints. So we have to believe these are saved people. But this is a church that had buku problems. They were prideful. They had division among them. There was sexual immorality in the church. People were suing each other. Um, they, they misunderstood what marriage means, uh, what singleness meant, what divorce meant, and they were misusing their liberty in the Lord Jesus Christ. This was a church that was a mess. And one of the areas that really was a mess for the Corinthians was what happened at the Lord's Supper. In chapters in chapter 11, they're messing with the Lord's Supper. In chapters uh, 12, 13, and 14, they're having problem with the spiritual gifts. In chapter 15, some of them are even denying the resurrection of the dead. Um, and yet, the Bible says these people are saved. Well, let's talk about um, one incident in this church. Uh, and it's the incident of the Lord's Supper. Now, he's giving instructions in chapter 11, verses 17 through 22. And uh, let's just read what it says. Now, in the giving of this instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Now, this is what's happening in the church. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. Paul's no dummy. Um, I hear that there are uh, factions and among you, and those that are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, that's the local church, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That's just not what's happening. What's happening is they're eating their own supper. The Bible says, For in eating, one takes his own supper ahead of the other, and one is hungry and another is drunk. And this is happening in the church. There are people who have no money, they have no food, and they come. We're going to have a potluck in a little bit here in the church. And uh, people bring their food and we all line up and everybody eats. Uh, but in this day, and I remember this happening in a church that I was associated with not long ago, the people would bring and they'd say, now I've got my food in the other room here. You go in there and get food out of, out of those pots, but don't tell anybody what's in there. Well, that's not eating together and fellowshipping together. That's a little clique. It's a little club. And so one was hungry and another was drunk. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? I say unto you, shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you, Paul said. So he said, For I received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night which he was betrayed took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new testament, the new covenant of my blood. For as oft as ye drink, it you in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you do proclaim the lord's death till he come and then he makes a statement therefore whosoever eats or drinks the cup of the lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the lord now these people were eating and drinking and carrying on they they were not examining themselves and they were doing this and God, and Paul says if you persist in this God is going to discipline you but then he gives this remedy he said if a man will examine himself 
Uh, you're not to sit around and say, well, let me think about Brother Dale over here. I'll see if I can figure Dale. No, you're to take care of yourself. Don't worry about Brother Smell Fungus over there. Just examine yourself and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whosoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner ain't eats and drinks judgment on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You're not paying attention to what you're doing. And for this reason, Paul says, many are weak. And you know, I looked that up in the Greek. You know what it means? Weak. And uh, sick. You know what that means? Uh, sick. And many sleep. And you say, what does that mean? Well, it's a nice way of saying some of you are dead. Some of you have physically died, which is what God sometimes has to do with his children when they will not listen. And listen, um, he say, it's time for you to go on a timeout. And he takes them permanently out of time and uh, he judges them. And so the Bible says that we should uh, judge ourselves rather than to allow God to judge us. For if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. It's not the point that God is going to beat us into submission. God is not going to want to do anything. He wants us to grow and become more like him. If we refuse to do that, then God will take us out of this world that we will not be condemned with the world. And so the word here is in the second class condition, if, that means here basically, if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. But that was the problem. They were not judging themselves. They were not examining themselves. And they were failing to take spiritual inventory. And uh, if you'll notice uh, verse 31 here in this passage, it said, if we're chastened to the Lord, we're not condemned with the world. So if we fail to judge ourselves, we're going to be chastened. In other words, a willingness to judge yourself will exclude or bypass the chastening of the Lord or maybe minimize it. God often does that. But now there are times, um, been built consequences of sin, where God just has to deal with us. But isn't it wonderful that God is a God of grace and he allows us plenty of time to make a better choice after you sin. He doesn't immediately drop the hammer on you. Um, and so the Bible tells us that if we acknowledge it, if we judge ourselves, then God will not have to judge us. So this is the judgment of uh, self. And the Bible said, Most assuredly I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on me has sent me, on him who sent me has everlasting life. Has everlasting life. Do you know what the word everlasting means? Everlasting. Uh, and shall not come into judgment. You know what shall not come into judgment means? You're not going to come into judgment. God is not going to judge you. But you have passed from death unto life. And so God doesn't want to pass judgment on anyone. Notice what he says here again. We come back to it. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. If we carefully keep close accounts of sin and all of that, then God says, I won't have to discipline you. But if we refuse to do that, we will be chastened by the Lord that we will not be condemned with the world. In other words... God will choose to chasten us where he will not bother the devil's children. I don't, when I had a little girl and I guarantee you when my, my daughter did wrong, I didn't go get all the neighbor kids and say, I'm going to beat you in front of them, uh, in front of her so she see the consequence. No, I dealt with my daughter where it needed to be dealt with um, and not uh, the other kids in the neighborhood. God doesn't spank the devil's kids. Um, the Bible gives us the remedy for this if we confess our sin. And the word confess here is homo legomenus. It means to say the same thing. Homo the same, lego meaning to say. Literally, if we agree with God concerning our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This is not about salvation. This is about restoring fellowship. Um, I was a teenager in my mom and dad's house. 
And there were times that I did things that my parents did not approve of. I was still their son, no matter how often I did things that they did not approve of. But I guarantee you this, you could live in that house with mom and dad and know that they were not pleased with me. And so when I made the fellowship right between mom and dad, suddenly it was much better to live in that household. So, um, basically that is the judgment of self in the Bible. Let's come to the judgment of the believer's works. We know about this, about the Bema Seat of Christ. This will take place after the rapture, and it's going to take place in heaven. This is going to be a wonderful time. I know people all the time read about this. They talk about there's tears in heaven, and everybody's crying and all that kind of the tears are in heaven because God's wiping the tears out of our eyes from being down here on the earth. We're not going to be, I, I, and you know what? If every single work I have ever done on the face of this earth goes up in, in smoke, I got news for you. I'm still better off than the worst person in hell. And I'm very thankful for the fact that Jesus saved me and the fact that I'm going to be in heaven is a wonderful thing. That I get rewards is even better. And by the way, God is not one of those gods uh, like today that everybody gets a participation trophy. You know, and, yeah, well, you participated, you messed up, but you participated. No, God gives reward where reward is due. So let's look at this judgment. It is the judgment at the time in which a believer will give an account of himself to God as to his motives, his conduct, and his service. Notice it's not about sin. It's about his motive, his conduct, and his service. This is a, a report. It has nothing to do whatsoever with my sin. Having done this, Jesus will reward that believer according to to his faithfulness. You say, when is this going to take place? When the rapture of the church occurs, here's this judgment right here. So at the cross is right here. During the church age is the judgment of self. Now the Bema seat of Christ is here. When the Lord calls the church home, harpazos the church, takes them home, then the judgment seat of Christ takes place. Notice what the Bible says concerning the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. No other foundation can any man that lay that which laid. That's Jesus Christ. Everything depends on Jesus. The very fact that I'm in heaven depends on Jesus. Now, I have been left to build on this foundation, and there are two categories of materials I can use. There's gold, silver, and precious stones. Those are things that have lasting worth and lasting value. And there's wood, hay, and stubble. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test everyone's work, what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. Notice that. And if any man's work is burned, he will suffer loss. Yet notice, he himself will be saved. Yet so as by fire. This is the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. And so notice the two categories of things here. You have the permanent, the valuable, the, wood, the, the gold, silver, and precious stones, and the wood, hay, and stubble. Those are perishable materials. And the Bible says that God is going to declare by his righteous judgment what quality it is or what sort it is. If anyone's work that he's built on endures, that's wonderful. He'll get a reward for it. If it burns up, then he will not get the reward, but he himself will be saved, yet as by fire. Now notice here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10 gives us further light on this. Therefore, we make our aim, whether to be present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. That's the, that's the criteria. We want to be well-pleasing to the Lord, not to myself, 
but to the Lord. For we must all appear before the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, that we may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good, that is gold, silver, and precious stones, or the other word that we might use for this is worthy, worthy. And bad, wood, hay, or stubble, or worthless. Can I, can I point this out to you? It can be the very same thing. Let's just say uh, Brother Dale and I both appear at the judgment seat of Christ. And we both have uh, been men of prayer. But uh, what Brother Dale has been doing with his prayers, he's been praying for lost souls, been trying to do things that uh, will extend the, the work of God out into the world and, and all of that. Brother Dale has just been a wonderful man of intercessory prayer. Now, I've been praying because I've got a list. I have to do 50 things each day. And one of those 50 things is I have to spend an hour in prayer. And so every day I struggle, I work, I do that. But I am very proud to tell you I spend an hour in prayer. Now, Dale and I have done exactly the same thing. We both prayed. But in the case of Dale, it's going to be worthy because Dale has done that which is right before the Lord. What I have done has been checking off a box, a legalistic set of requirements, and there's not going to be a reward for that. Uh, I've got my reward down here because they gave me a pen at church saying, I'm one of the chief prayer warriors. Um, there, there are going to be plenty of people who have never missed a service, have a chain of every year they get a, a new thing, they hang on their chain saying, I've had perfect attendance. And the reason was that they could get another thing each year to hang on their chain. Well, they've already got their reward. But if they want to be there to hear the word of God, to have it uh, taught to them. And so the whole idea here is, why do you do what you do? If you go to Smiley's because you want to make sure everybody thinks you're really spiritual, then I'm sorry, you've already got your reward. But if you go to Smiley's because you have a burning desire to see people saved, see people straightened out, and all of that, you know what? God will reward that. It's the idea of why you did it and how you did it. And that, by the way, and, by, and I just have to tell you, there are going to be a lot of music programs that are currently in the churches that are going to be burned up. I mean, it's all to be up there in front of everybody and to wave their hand and to sway back and forth and sing the same song with the same lyrics 25,000 different times. I'm sorry, that's just worthless as far as God is concerned. And so the Bible says that um, we will be saved, we will not be lost, but we will receive a lack of rewards. You say, what are those rewards? Well, um, this will not happen till the Lord comes back, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. And when he comes back, he's going to give us crowns, the Bible tells us. Uh, the Greek word is Stephanus. It's where we got our word Stephen from. And there are a number of crowns in the Bible. Now, is that all the crowns that there are? Well, I don't know. I don't think so. I think there will be many crowns. But let me just run through the crowns briefly as I am running out of time here. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8 is the crown of righteousness. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown, a Stephanus of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. What day? The day of the uh, Bema seat of Christ. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. This is a a reward for fighting the good fight of faith, finishing the course, keeping the faith. Um, this is a very faithful, this is really a crown of faithfulness, righteous faithfulness. Then that leads me to the next crown, that's the crown of life, James chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 2. The Bible tells us, uh, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for it, when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised. And Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, be faithful unto death, and I will give you 
the crown of life. And then, uh, so this is the, the crown uh, for serving the Lord. And uh, it was also known as the martyr's crown. This is the one for being faithful. In spite of all the circumstances, God will give you a crown of life. And then the crown of glory. Um, this is a crown that as pastors, Brother uh, Dennis and myself, really hope and believe the Lord will give us someday. The Bible says, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory, which does not fade away. This is the crown for faithful pastors. So that is the judgment of uh, the believer's works. It's called the Bema Seat of Christ. And I am at the point now whether I could, I could go on, but I would have to cram things, and I don't intend to do that. So I'm going to bring it to a close at this point. We have covered so far four or three of the judgments. We've got a few more to go. Uh, there are seven of them, and uh, we'll pick that up on a later time. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that nothing goes unblessed and unchallenged by you. I thank you, Lord, that there are some people who can go through life and uh, who can do things that all appear to be uh, blessed of the Lord, that appear that you know they're just very religious, godly people. But in reality, they're just doing it to t tick off a box, uh, to follow a, uh, um, somebody's rules. In reality, what you're interested in is we're motivated by love and do what you want us to do according to your word. Thank you that you're a God of justice and a God of judgment, and I pray your will would be done in our lives. We give you honor and praise for what you're going to do, and we give you thanks for the blessings of God, for it's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen.